Zombie Science, Part 2. We've been looking at the book uh, Zombie Science by Jonathan Wells, um, published this last year. Um, it's a follow-up to a book uh, by Jonathan Wells called Icons of Evolution. And basically what we'll be looking at today is the follow-up of what happened to those icons. Um, the book looks like that. Um, last week we looked at two chapters, Who Let the Zombies Out, which uh, had introductory remarks in, including about science, evolution, and trusting scientists. And uh, this, uh, we also looked at the Tree of Life, and the Tree of Life and homology are two of the icons of evolution that have become part of the zomb uh, part of zombie science, and so we're uh, we're looking at that, or we were looking at that. Uh, this week we're going to uh, look at the first part of the chapter, chapter three, survival of the fakest. After it was published in 2000, my book, Icons of Evolution, got rave reviews, filled not with lavish praise, but with furious denunciations. Several critics wrote that I was stupidly trying to discredit evolution just because of a few textbook mistakes. According to evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne, Wells' book rests entirely on a flawed syllogism. Hence, textbooks illustrate evolution with examples. These examples are sometimes presented in incorrect or misleading ways. Therefore, evolution is a fiction. <coughs> Biologist and philosopher Massimo Piglucci wrote, because there are omissions, simplifications, and inaccuracies in some general biology textbooks, obviously the modern theory of evolution must be wrong. This is the astonishing line of reasoning that is the backbone of Jonathan Wells' icons of evolution. Kevin Padian and Alan Gischet, uh, Gishlik of the militantly pro-evolution National Center for Science Education made the same point, heavily seasoned with scorn. The wine expert. Wells reminds us of those kids who used to write to the letters page of Superman comics many years ago. Dear editor, they would write, you made a boo-boo. On page six, you colored Superman's cape green, but it should be red. Okay, kid, mistakes happens, but it, did it really affect the story? Wells cannot hurt the story of evolution. Like a petulant child, he can only throw tantrums. But if the icons of evolution were really just a few textbook boo-boos, biologists would have quickly corrected them. This point can be illustrated with an actual example from a physics te textbook. The 1997 edition of Prentice Hall's Exploring Physical Science contained a photograph of singer Linda Ronstadt holding a microphone. And the caption identified her as a silicon crystal doped with arsenic. Well, that may be true, but that's a different question. Uh, <laughs> the following page had a drawing of a silicon crystal doped with arsenic, accompanied by a caption about the usefulness of solid state microphones. Obviously, the captions had been inadvertently switched. John L. Hubitz pointed this out in a Packard Foundation report on mistakes in physical science textbooks. Of course, the publisher corrected the mistake in subsequent editions. Imagine, though, the following scenario. The identification of Ronstadt as a silicon crystal appears year after year in almost all science textbooks. The caption is consistent with other materials in the textbook promoting the theory that human life is based on silicon rather than carbon. And the theory is vigorously defended by establishment science, even to the point of vilifying its critics. Obviously, we would no longer be dealing with a mistake, but with a deliberate campaign to convince people that life is silicon-based. If the icons of evolution were just innocent mistakes, as Coyne, Piglucci, Padian, and Gishlik claimed, then the icons would have been corrected in subsequent textbooks, just as the Ronstadt as a silicon crystal error was quickly corrected in the physical science textbook. Let's see what actually happened. The Miller-Urey experiment. After the first edition of The Origin of Species appeared in 1859, Darwin concluded 
later editions with the statement that life had been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one. A few years later, Darwin wrote to his friend Joseph Hooker, I have long regretted that I truckled to public opinion by using the biblical term, when what he really meant was appeared by some wholly unknown process. In 1871, Darwin wrote to Hooker again and outlined his true thinking about the origin of life. If, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., are present, that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. Skipping over a paragraph there. In the 1920s, Russian scientist A.I. Oprin and British scientist uh, J.S.B.S. Haldane suggested that the Earth's primitive atmosphere consisted mainly of methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. The first three are what chemists ca uh, call reducing gases. In a reducing atmosphere, according to Oprin and Haldane, natural energy sources such as lightning could have produced the chemical building blocks of life. An interesting idea, but could it be tested? In 1953, University of Chicago graduate student Stanley Miller announced that he had shown experimentally in the laboratory of his PhD advisor, Harold Urey, that lightning in the Earth's primitive atmosphere could have produced amino acids, the chemical building block of protein. Uh, Miller used a closed gas apparatus in which he boiled water, circulated the steam with a mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, passed a spark discharge, and then collected the products in a container at the bottom. After a week, he analyzed the result, a brown tarry mixture, and detected some of the amino acids that occur in living cells. The experiment was widely advertised as evidence that scientists had demonstrated the first step in the origin of life. By 1980, however, most geochemists had concluded that the Earth's early atmosphere probably wasn't a reducing atmosphere, as Oprin and Haldane had supposed, and as Miller had assumed when constructing his experiment. Instead, the early atmosphere likely consisted of neutral gases like those emitted from modern volcanoes, mostly water vapor, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, though some carbon monoxide, a reducing gas, is also emitted. Since hydrogen is the lightest element, if there had been any in the early atmosphere, it would probably have escaped into space. In 1983, Miller reported that he and a colleague had sparked an atmosphere containing carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide instead of methane and ammonia, as they, and they were able to produce a small amount of the simplest amino acid, but only if the atmosphere contained more hydrogen than carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. In order to produce other amino acids, they needed not only an excess of free hydrogen, but also methane. Harvard geochemist Heinrich Holland came to a similar conclusion. So the Miller-Urey experiment could not produce amino acids from a realistic mixture of gases. Furthermore, the brown tarry mixture that it produced contained not only amino acids, but also substances that would have interfered with the origin of life. For example, the mixture contained cyanide and formaldehyde. In fact, uh, most of these mixtures contain more cyanide than anything else. Um, that's my addition. In 2015, an international team of scientists reported that bacteria could survive in the residue from a miller year experiment, but only after the residue had first been purified to remove these toxic substances. So in other words, primordial soup is not good for bacteria. The textbooks respond. So how did the biology textbooks respond to these discoveries? showing that Stanley Miller's experiment missed the mark. Many of them in 2000 persisted in using images of, from the Miller-Urey apparatus to convince students that scientists had demonstrated the first step in the origin of life. And many biology textbooks are still doing this. For example, Kenneth Mason, Jonathan Losos, and Susan Singer's 2014 edition of Raven and Johnson's widely used biology acknowledges that there is a controversy over the composition of the Earth's early atmosphere, but it proceeds to tell the standard story anyway. 
It concludes that Stanley Miller demonstrated that, the key, that key molecules of life could have formed in the reducing atmosphere of the early Earth. Well, if, life, if the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere, that is. Um, Kenneth Miller and Joseph Levine, 2014 Biology, this is a standard textbook now, um, well after the uh, Icons of Evolution is written in 2000. Keep that in mind. Um, includes a drawing of the Miller-Urey apparatus with the following caption. Miller and Urey produced amino acids which are needed to make proteins by passing sparks through a mixture of hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor. Evidence now suggests that the composition of Earth's early atmosphere was different from their 1953 experiment. However, more recent experiments with different mixtures of gases have produced similar results. Wow. This last statement is profoundly misleading, if not downright false. As we saw above, Stanley Miller himself showed that his experiment needed excess hydrogen to produce even the simplest amino acid, and methane was necessary to produce more complex amino acids. So the different mixtures of gases that Kenneth and Miller and Joseph Levine claim produce similar results must have been very different from the probable atmosphere of the early Earth. According to the 2014 edition of Campbell's Biolo Campbell Biology and the 2014 edition of Scott Freeman's Biological Science, both of which feature drawings of Miller's apparatus, Miller-Urey type experiments using realistic mi mixtures of volcanic gases have produced organic molecules such as formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide. Yes, but as we saw above, these chemicals are very toxic to living cells. Life could not have emerged spontaneously from a primordial soup containing significant amounts of them. A volcanic experiment to the rescue? The 2016 edition of Mater and Wendelspect's Biology accompanies its drawings of the Miller-Urey apparatus with this. In 2008, a group of scientists examined 11 vials of compounds produced from variations of the Miller-Urey experiment and found a greater variety of organic molecules that Miller re than Miller reported, including all 22 amino acids. Um, of course, doses are not mentioned, but that's a different question. True, but the additional amino acids all came from experiments that used a mixture of reducing gases. So the experiment suffered from the same flaw as the original one. The 2014 edition of Campbell Biology mentions the same 2008 study. Um, in all fairness, the authors of Campbell Biology may have made an honest mistake in this case, misled by a 2008 article in Science entitled The Miller Volcanic Spark Discharge Experiment. Jeffrey Bada, who completed his PhD under Stanley Miller, and five other scientists examined, the sample, uh, examined samples saved from a 1955 experiment in which Miller modified his apparatus by using a narrow nozzle to inject steam from the boiling water into the circulating gases, I suppose to imitate a fumarole or something. Based on a 2000 report suggesting that small water droplets in volcanic eruptions can attract lightning, Bata and his colleagues claim that this modification possibly simulates the spark discharge synthesis by lightning in a steam-rich volcanic eruption, and they call this the volcanic experiment. But Miller himself did not call it volcanic, and for good reason. The only thing volcanic about it was that instead of passing the gases over boiling water, Miller injected steam into them. But the gases he used in 1955 were the same that he used in 1953, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. So despite its irrelevance to the origin of life on Earth, the Miller-Urey experiment just keeps coming back. Why? The grand materialistic story. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is a materialistic story of about how life diversified after it originated. But Darwin realized that his evolutionary story is incomplete without a materialistic explanation for the origin of life. That is, if you have a materialism all the way, you can't start with life. He hoped that such an origin could be shown to have been possible in some warm little pond on the ancient earth. But what if the origin of life cannot be explained materialistically? What if it required the origin of new information, which is immaterial? And what if that information required an intelligence? 
In his 2009 book, Signature in the Cell, philosopher of science Stephen Meyer argues that the complex information in biological molecules cannot result from unguided natural processes such as the spontaneous aggregation of chemicals. The only known source of large amounts of complex information is intelligence. Therefore, Meyer concludes, the origin of life required intelligent design. But science says no, life must have originated materialistically. So origin of life researchers rely more on a grand materialistic story than they do on evidence. Biologist Jack Sostak tells the, following, uh, tells the story this way. I think he's the one that uh, had to retract one of those papers um, not that long ago. Simple chemistry in diverse environments on the early Earth led to the emergence of ever more complex chemistry and ultimately to the synthesis of the critical biological building blocks. At some point, the assembly of these materials into primitive cells enabled the emergence of Darwinian evolutionary behavior, followed by the gradual evolution of more complex life forms leading to modern life. That's the story. But if this story, but, but this story consists entirely of assumptions. If, and oh, what a big if, simple chemistry led to the synthesis of biological building blocks, and if these building blocks assemble themselves into primitive cells, et cetera, et cetera, none of these steps have been empirically demonstrated. In fact, origin of life research has been spectacularly unsuccessful. The Miller-Urey experiment is just one of its many dead ends. Rice University synthetic organic chemist James Tour uh, made some comments which I will skip over in the interest of time. Uh, they're worth looking at if you have the book. And prebiotic synthesis would be just the first step. Even if we could explain how life's chemical building blocks formed on the early Earth, we would still be a very long way from explaining how they assembled themselves into a living cell. But the grand materialistic story lumbers on. Heckel's embryos. Darwin thought that embryology provided by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. In 1859, he wrote that we would see a close similarity of in the embryos of widely different animals in the same class, and that this similarity reveals community of descent. Ten years later, he wrote that it is highly probable that with many animals, the embryonic or larval stages show us more or less completely the state of the progenitor of the whole group in its adult condition. To support his point, Darwin cited some drawings of vertebrate embryos made by German biologist Ernst Haeckel which, and we'll see figure 3.1 in just a minute. Heckel's contemporaries accused him of faking his drawings to make the embryos appear more alike than they really were. Nevertheless, the drawings continue to be widely used in textbooks as evidence of common descent. And there's the drawings as they appear in um, uh, zombie science. Now, actually, I'm gonna tell you that there should be three instead of just two rows. And um, uh, that doesn't show in zombie science at all, which I think is a mistake. So I went to uh, Talk Origins and found some more drawings. Um, this is Wells and he Heckel's Embryos, a review of chapter five of Icons of Evolution by P.Z. Myers, noted creationist. Um, and there they are. This is the actual original, even to the Schwein Mensch, this um, obviously uh, German, yeah. Uh, so um, if you look here, you can see these are almost identical. Now there's the second row, which looks like the drawings in uh, the first row of uh, uh, Wells' book, uh, Zombie Science. And then here is where you can see that they're obviously diverging. Um, and the idea is that these look almost the same. Well, they do. Uh, anyway, recently the credibility of the drawings took another hit. In 1997, there's a, this is actually not disputable. Um, but the icon was just too good to abandon without a fight. Never mind the evidence. 
In 2008, a University of Chicago historian Robert Richards published a book defending Haeckel against charges of fraud. According to Richards, Haeckel's drawings were no less accurate than those of his contemporaries, including the people who criticized him. Uh, as if that clears the uh, problem up. Cambridge historian Nick Hopwood also defended Haeckel against the fraud charge in a 2015 book that includes several pages criticizing icons of evolution as a creationist primer for textbook activism. The real issue, however, is not whether Haeckel deliberately committed fraud. Uh, well, I would say that is an issue too. Uh, the real issue is that Haeckel's drawings omitted half the evidence. The half that doesn't fit Darwin's claim that embryos are most similar in their early stages. By the logic of Darwin's argument, the earliest stages should be most, the most similar, but vertebrate embryos actually start out looking very different from each other. Then they converge somewhat in appearance midway through development, Heckel's first stage, before diverging to their adult forms. Biologist Rudolf Raff has called this pattern the developmental hourglass and we'll see figure 3.2 just a minute. Heckel helped draw a Darwin by simply omitting the top half of the hourglass. And there's the hourglass and you can see that some of these are very flat, some of these are more or less round with a hole in the middle and some of them are round with two holes in the middle and um, then they converge more or less. You'll notice that the convergence isn't quite as good as Heckel drew them. Um, and then, of course, they diverge to the animals themselves. When Jerry Coyne in reviewed Icons of Evolution in 2001, he criticized the book for failing to recognize that embryos of different vertebrates tended to resemble one another in the early stages, but divergence development proceeds with more closely related species diverging less widely thus providing copious evidence for evolution. In other words, the standard story. Yet Coyne knew that vertebrate embryos are not most similar in their early stages. Indeed, in the same review, he acknowledged that the earliest vertebrate embryos, mere balls of cells, are often less similar to one another than they are at subsequent stages. Coyne followed this in, with a 2009 book entitled Why Evolution is True, which contained the following. Each vertebrate undergoes development in a series of stages, and the sequence of those stages happens to follow the evolutionary sequence of its ancestors. Thus, all vertebrates begin development looking like embryonic fish because we de all descended from a fish-like ancestor. Well, if you say so, sir. Um, textbook still haunted by Heckel's embryos. In 2000, Stephen Jay Gould, this is the same time that um, uh, Wells was publishing Icons of Evolution. Stephen Jay Gould wrote that we should all be astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not a majority, of modern textbooks. Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, not exactly well no, well known creationist. Um, Heckel's embryos, it seemed, were not just dead, they deserved to be buried face down. Yet many textbooks published after 2000 continue to use versions of Heckel's drawings as evidence for, of evolution, for evolution. Donald Prothero's 2013 textbook, Bringing Fossils to Life, actually features Heckel's original drawings. Mater and uh, Wendell Specht's 2016 biology uses a redrawn version of Heckel's embryos. Some recent textbooks don't use drawings but make essentially the same claim. Uh, just don't tell anybody that the drawings um, are, are fraudulent. Say you don't show them so therefore you don't have to defend them. The 2014 edition of Raven and Johnson's Biology tells students some of the strongest anatomical evidence supporting evolution comes from comparisons of how organisms develop. Embryos of different types of vertebrates, for example, are of, often are similar early on, but become more different as they develop. Miller and Levine's 2014 biology informs its readers that, quote, 
The early developmental stages of many animals with backbones, called vertebrates, look very similar, end quote. And these similarities provide, quote, evidence that organisms have descended from a, co more, uh, from a common ancestor, end quote. So you just make the claim without putting the icon up. I guess that's one way of keeping yourself from being criticized. So despite the evidence, Heckel's embryos continue to stalk the halls of science education. When materials containing Heckel-like illustrations were submitted in 2011 to the Texas State Board of Education for adoption into the science curriculum, Discovery Institute's Casey Luskin wrote, like a zombie that just won't die, these bogus drawings keep coming back. I wonder if that's the uh, origin of the term zombie science. Flock of dodos. In 2007, biologist turned filmmaker Randy Olson released a film c titled Flock of Dodos, the Evolution Intelligent Design Circus. The film included an interview with John Calvert, director of the Intelligent Design Network, who asked Olson whether he had read Icons of Evolution. Olson said he had, and this filmmaker is saying this, and he acknowledged that Heckel did commit scientific fraud. But he insisted that Heckel is no longer relevant to what's being taught today, and the embryo drawings are no longer used in textbooks. There's no trace of them, Olson claimed. But Olson already knew of textbooks published after 2000 that contained such drawings. In 2007, he came to Seattle for a screening of his film and, to his credit, stopped by the office of the Discovery Institute, where Casey Luskin and I showed him a stack of recent textbooks that used versions of Heckel's embryos to teach evolution. Olson's response, in essence, was that the story he told in his film was too good, just too good to give up. At that point, the Discovery Institute established a website to document Olson's misrepresentations. Skipping on, in 2015, Olson published a book titled Houston, We Have a Narrative, in which he wrote, scientists must realize that science is a narrative process, that narrative is story, and therefore science needs story, Just so. even if the story is untrue. Archaeopteryx. Two years after Darwin first published The Origin of Species, a fossil bird was discovered in Germany that had teeth, a long lizard-like tail and claws on its wings. Its discovery named it Archaeopteryx, or ancient wing. Since Archaeopteryx had features of reptiles as well as birds, some people regarded it as the missing link between those two groups and a confirmation of Darwin's theory. That's historical fact. In, by, in 1998, anthropologist Pat Shipman wrote that Archaeopteryx is, quoting an icon, a holy relic of the past that has become a powerful symbol of the evolutionary process itself. It is the first bird, end quote. I suppose we should uh, put a cathedral around it or something. Um, but there are too many structural differences between Archaeopteryx and modern birds for the latter to be descendants of the former. In 1985, paleontologist Larry Martin wrote, Ar Archaeopteryx is not ancestral to any group of modern birds. Instead, it is the earliest known member of a totally extinct group of birds. If animals evolved in a branching tree pattern, as Darwin believed, then Archaeopteryx was at the end of a long dead branch. But if Archaeopteryx is not the ancestor of modern birds, what was? This question has generated a heated controversy among evolutionary biologists. Some, most prominently Berkeley's Kevin Padian, believe that birds evolved from dinosaurs, while others, most prominently North Carolina's Alan Fiducia, believe that they evolved from a very different group of extinct reptiles. It's got to be from reptiles because it's not going to be from amphibians, it's not going to be directly from fish, and uh, there aren't any other really good choices, uh, other than, of course, creation, and we're not going there. Nevertheless, the Dino Bird Party has declared itself to be the scientific consensus. As far as they're concerned, the debate is over, and science says birds are dinosaurs. When the fossil of a dinosaur covered with tiny fibers was discovered in China in 1996, the fibers were called protofeathers and the animal was proclaimed a feathered dinosaur. 
it should have been proto-feathered dinosaur, but whatever. Many more such fossils have been found since then, and the scientific consensus claims them all as evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. But critics disagree, and there's more of that in the book. Uh, let will skip over a good share of it. Um, both sides in the dino bird controversy must invent ghost lineages to connect the fossils with each other. Neither side has found the ancestor of modern birds, but one thing is for sure, Archaeopteryx is not it. Nevertheless, the 2014 edition of Raven and Johnson's Biology still calls it Archaeopteryx the first bird. And Prothera's 13, 2013 textbook Bringing Fossils to Life still calls Ar Archaeopteryx a missing link between reptiles and birds. Apparently this icon of evolution, like Olson's story about Heckel's embryos, is just too good to give up. Peppered moths. Darwin was convinced that in the course of evolution, natural selection had been the main, but not exclusive means of uh, modification. But, as we noted in chapter one, he had no evidence for this. The best he could do in the origin of species was to give one or two imaginary illustrations. It wasn't until the 1950s that British physician Bernard Kettlewell provided what seemed to be good evidence of natural selection. During industrialization in the 19th century, peppered moths in England went from being mostly light-colored to m being mostly dark-colored, or melanic, a phenomenon known as industrial melanism. In 1896, British biologist uh, uh, J.W. Tutt, and those are my ellipses, attributed industrial melanism to natural selection. Half a century later, Kettlewell tested Hutt's hypoth Tutt's hypothesis by a releasing marked light and dark moths onto nearby tree trunks in polluted and unpolluted woodlands. Kettlewell later recaptured some of the marked individuals and noticed, noted that the proportion of light moths had increased in the unpolluted woods and the proportion of dark moths had increased in the polluted woods, which was consistent with Tutt's hypothesis. In an article written for Scientific American, Kettlewell called this Darwin's missing evidence. Now, think about what is being written about there. What that means is that the evidence was missing until Kettlewell got there. So if Kettlewell's uh, data is not very convincing, then it's still missing. Skipping on, it's worth pointing out that even if the classic peppered moth story were true, it would not confirm Darwin's claim that new species organs and body plants were produced by unguided evolution. All it would demonstrate is that natural selection produced a shift in the proportions of two existing varieties of the same species. Problems with the classic story. In the 1980s, researchers discovered that peppered moths don't normally rest on tree trunks. Instead, they mostly rest where they are hidden, probably in the higher branches of trees. Furthermore, peppered moths rarely fly in the daytime. So by releasing moths onto nearby tree trunks in daylight, Kettlewell had created an unnatural situation. But now we know that the textbooks, textbook photographs had been staged, often with dead moths pinned or glued in place. In 1998, British biologist Michael Majerus published a book about industrial melanism that included a table showing the resting uh, positions of peppered moths found in the wild between 1964 and 1996. Forty-seven had been found resting in the wild, and of these, only six had been found on exposed tree trunks, which are, of course, the easiest place to find them. Um, Majerus concluded that peppered moths do not naturally rest in exposed positions on tree trunks. In a review of Majerus' book for Nature, Jerry Coyne wrote, from time to time, evolutionists re-examine a classic experimental study and find to their horror that it is flawed or downright wrong. For Coyne, the mere fact that peppered moths don't normally rest on tree trunks invalidated Kettlewell's experiments. Coyne compared his reaction to the dismay attending my discovery at the age of six that it was my father and not Santa who brought the presents on Christmas Eve. He acknowledged that he was embarrassed at having taught the classic story, a textbook story for many years. Now keep in mind, he's reviewing it presumably within a year or two of, the, of it being published, so about 2000, 
1999, something like that. As empirical science, the classic story seemed as dead as the moths in the staged photographs. In 2002, the New York Times featured some of the photographs in an article titled On Scientific Fakery and the Systems to Catch It. Many biology textbooks dropped the classic story, but advocates of, def of evolution defended it anyway. Coyne even reversed himself in 2002, writing in a review of another book that, despite arguments about the precise mechanism of selection, industrial melanism still represents a splendid example of uh, evolution in action. Now, Coyne is saying it's great. Meanwhile, Majerus set out to find uh, better evidence for the story, so Majerus feels it's not that great. Majerus' new evidence, from 2001 to 2006, Majerus studied uh, peppered moths in a large, unpolluted world garden about 60 miles north of London. He began by climbing a few trees where he counted 135 moths resting on trunks, branches, and twigs. Of these, most were on branches, but 48, 36% were on the trunks. Majerus concluded that his results may be somewhat biased towards lower parts of the tree due to sampling technique. Brits are known for understating things, but this deserves a place in the understatement hall of fame. Since Majerus's goal was to find out where the peppered moths normally rest, and biologists had already concluded that they probably rest in the higher branches of trees, Majerus should have found a way to survey those higher branches, not just the ones he could reach by climbing up a tree from the ground. He could have built some scaffolds, or he could have rented a hydraulic aerial work platform. As it is, his technique was a bit like counting fish in the ocean from the deck of a boat and concluding that most of them live within 10 feet of the surface. Over the course of six years, Majerus artificially released almost 5,000 light and dark moths onto the trees. He would release a few moths each night into netting sleeves he had placed around selected branches. Then he would remove the sleeves before dawn and note the branches on which moths had come to rest. Four hours later, he would count those still on the branches. In four of the six years, more dark moths disappeared than light ones. I presume that the other two years, the more light ones disappeared than dark ones. Um, Majerus did ob observe some moths actually being eaten by birds, but he assumed all moths had disappeared, had been eaten by birds, and that none had disappeared and simply moved to a different location. Despite his obvious sampling bias and his unsupported assumption that all disappearing moths had to, be, had to have been eaten by birds, Majerus confidently interpreted his findings as evidence for the classic Darwinian story of evolution. Thus, when Majerus presented his results in 2007, he urged the teaching of the peppered moth story again because it provides, after all, the proof of evolution. Notice that's his bold face. It didn't, of course, but Majerus clearly wanted it to. At one point in his presentation, he revealed why, declaring out of the blue that humans invented God and that there will be no second coming, no helping hand from on high. Apparently, what really mattered to Majerus was the grand materialistic story. This is not empirical science, but zombie science. Now, my take on all this, Wells, I think, is making a case for textbooks not letting go of classic icons or images that seem to prove evolution even when their foundations are known to be shaky, or in the case of Heckel's embryos, downright fraudulent. He does this with the Miller-Urey experiment, Heckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, and the peppered moth story. There's more coming next week. He makes a good case in all four instances, I think. Uh, what is particularly interesting is that none of the textbooks seem to qualify the evidence significantly. This is bad for their side. It presents an opportunity for their opponents to point out that they're being less than objective, and it discounts what they have to say. When we are presenting science, we need to be careful to present our arguments in a balanced way. That way we make it harder for opponents to point out the obvious flaws and discredit our arguments and our objectivity. 
One can argue that we can't afford to do this, but that argument concedes that we don't have the evidence on our side. I'm not sure that that's a winning argument. Uh, one other side effect of arguing that way is that when we do not acknowledge our weaknesses, at least to ourselves, we do not recognize the, the need to work on them. Um, just for an example, the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, if we had if we had pretended that everything was fine, nobody would have gone back and looked at the forest and found evidence that in fact it was deposited rapidly. Another example that comes to mind is the various efforts to understand radiometric in general and carbon-14 in If we had not gone back and said this is a problem with, uh, and then said we need to look at it, we would never have looked at it and we would not be where we are today. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, uh, can, uh, let's uh, snatch a uh, microphone here. Uh, okay. Um, just to comment on this last example. Uh, the peppered moss story is an interesting one. It's one which I took a special interest in when I was teaching. And uh, uh, one, one little piece that wasn't noted here is that there have been behavioral studies and that showed that birds would preferentially select uh, light moths on d uh, dark backgrounds and dark brown, uh, moths on light backgrounds. I see no problem in the industrial melanism story if it's in totally correct, because unless we are stuck on fixity of species, this is an example of, of the kind of thing that at least I, in, in my take, would, would uh, be comfortable saying this, this shows evidence for change. Uh, call it microevolution, call it what, and that's the way we used it in our program. Yeah. Uh, we, there was actually a kit put out at that time where they had uh, thin cardboard cutouts of light and dark moths and students were supposed to look very quickly and grab one. And of course they always first grabbed the ones that were on a contrasting background. Right. No, and, and the truth of the matter is that I don't even have a problem with the story being somewhat correct. I just, I think it's important for us if, if, we, if we use it, and therefore I think it's important for them if they use it, to, to say that there are these problems with it and then just uh, let the chips fall where they may. I, the, what I see happening is that objective science is morphing into um, <clears throat> what, what in the old days would have been called biased science. <laughs> um, actually, this gave us wonderful opportunity uh, though I wasn't teaching, this was in our first course, yeah. I wasn't teaching, I was playing an active role. Uh, <laughs> the thing you pointed out that is strongest about it is, is this is as good as, as it gets for demonstrating evolution? Yes, yes. And Before that, this, we didn't have it. And, and playing that up, frankly, is naive. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the general I don't mean naive for us, I mean naive for them, yeah. if, if that's as good as it gets. Yeah, the general principle, I think, actually is true. I really think that, that white animals in the Arctic survive better. You know, if you're a hare, it's harder for the, for the fox to find you. If you're a fox, it's harder for the hare to figure out you're sneaking up on him. Um, there's a reason why polar bears are white, you know? Um, it's, it's easier to catch a, a seal meal that way than, uh, than if you're black because, you know, you alert, the, you alert the seal to your presence if your coloration doesn't match. You know, I mean, it, it, 
the general principle I don't have a problem with. I just think that when you're doing this, that you should, you should acknowledge the difficulties in, in um, and I'm going to pull this back to, you know, carbon-14, because I'm going to say that, that this is a lesson for us as creationists as well. Um, I have seen some people who will say, and, you know, I love them, and they've done a lot of good work and all that, but, uh, but they will say that uh, the contamination isn't a problem, contamination in the laboratory. The problem is that you can demonstrate the contamination in the laboratory is a problem. Now, whether that answers all the questions or not is a whole different ballgame. And in fact, you can find people from the other side acknowledging that it doesn't answer all of the questions, specifically the stuff that uh, the ICR did. It doesn't answer those questions. And you have to invoke some other process. I think that two processes that have been attempted to be invoked are one of them producing carbon-14 with neutrons underground or massive contamination underground, none of which are intuitively helpful and the math doesn't really work very well. But uh, they're at least acknowledging that there's a problem and I think that that's important. Um, you know, it is almost like there are people on both sides who think that faith has to be 100% and are not willing to apportion faith to the amount of evidence behind it. Um, you know, if there is any problem that we have, to, protect, to try to pretend that it isn't there means we don't work on it. Um, once, you, once you realize that it is there, then you can say, well, you know, what can we do to, to demonstrate the extent of that problem? And then, and then you can actually do something worthwhile. So I, I think that there, there are lessons beyond just what we see here. But I think that it is fair to say that uh, at least some evolutionists have behaved badly in this, in this realm. Well, actually, in my experience, uh, committed Adventist young people who look at this are actually, some of them feel they need to isolate themselves more from those who would say, you see, there is no such thing as change in pepper moths. Yeah. Well, and they found that very troubling, rather than admitting it's an, an example of uh, small change. Yeah. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that in fact, if you don't admit small change, you're going to have to have a huge arc to house all the varieties. Yeah. And I don't r remember Aquaria and the arc. Aquaria? And the arc. Oh, yes. Well, that's true too. Um, but really the fish aren't the big problem. The problem is the animal, or uh, the, uh, the land animals. And, but, you know, in other words, if you have to have an African hunting dog and a, uh, uh, or actually two African hunting dogs, and then two dingoes, and then two uh, uh, coyotes, and then two uh, red wolves, and then two uh, gray wolves, and I mean, pretty soon you're starting to get r overrun. And then that still leaves you the problem with, well, how did we get uh, such things as, uh, you know, Pekingese and, and uh, poodles and uh, uh, African, or I should say, uh, greyhounds and uh, Afghan hounds. And I mean, the, the varieties are just unbelievable. That came out presumably all after the ark. We didn't have those kinds of varieties in there. So, uh, you know, the, the next question is, well, do you stuff all wolves, coyotes, and foxes together along with dingoes and African hunting dogs and then have a bunch of foxes or are those actually all one of the same, uh, same group? And we don't really know that. It'd be fun to find out sometime. 
And the Y chromosome may help us there because the Y chromosome forms a perfect tree. Father to son to grandson and, and there's no mixture there except for little tiny pieces on the end that you can ignore. And if you look at what happens to Y chromosomes in humans, it's just fascinating. And especially, and then you compare them with chimps and the, the difference is astounding. Uh, it, would be, it would be interesting to see how much variation we can get. But I mean, you made of one man all nations of Earth, right? Okay, so um, that means that the variations we have in humans have got to come from uh, basically one pair. Uh, well, if you go back to Adam, period, one pair. And so what that means is that all of that variety um, uh, you know, if you want to call it melanism, you can. Um, and if you're uh, if humans do that, there's no reason why peppered moths couldn't do it too. And so you wouldn't have to have um, uh, created light and dark peppered moths specifically. You could just simply have uh, a mutation that, um, that changed one to the other. I would suspect it'd be the darker moths that got, more, uh, got the mutation, but who knows? Maybe the light ones are the mutation. Um, would be interesting if somebody wanted to do that would be to to run the uh, DNA because we can do that now and see what kind of mutations we get and which one looks like it's more functional and then you can make an intelligent guess as to which one was the original but you wouldn't find problematic the original peppered moth having genetic vari variability and Melanism no, uh, or white. Uh, as a matter of fact, w one could look at it as a creation, as a safety mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to be specific, in the case of polar bears, polar bears are probably albinos. If we were to run their DNA, we would probably find that uh, there was a place where melanin is supposed to get into the uh, uh, into the hair and that it is actually uh, uh, it, th that, that melanin no longer gets into the hair because of a defect in mechanism. They have black skin, I understand. They do, so it's not like they can't, don't have any, um, they, they have black skin and they have black noses um, and they have, uh, you know, dark eyes. It's not like they have, you know, it's not a total albino. And so it's more of a, can it get into the hair than it is a, uh, than it is a problem of getting the uh, uh, melanin itself. And that's, of course, that happens in people as they age, is that they start getting less melanin in their hair uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously there is a mechanism to do it and obviously it doesn't work some of the time. Uh, and s some of us have less melanin in our hair than others because of uh, age-related defects. <laughs> uh, comment. Uh, I think Will has done a uh, tremendous job here and uh, digging through the literature and giving us uh, th this picture that he's presented. But, uh, just from a historical, I guess, interest, it's not significant, but uh, Wells gave a lecture here at Loma Linda, I believe in the 1980s, uh, to uh, the biology program here and so on. And, and uh, he, That's interesting. That's well before his book. Uh, icons of evolution. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm not completely clear on that date, but this is around that time. Uh, but I, I and it's a, it's a good story. I, I don't want us to leave here thinking that we're better or much better uh, in certain respects. I think we don't have as much science for people to criticize, you understand? We haven't done that much. Uh, that's one factor. Uh, but you take, for instance, the uh, persistent battle that seems to go on as to whether uh, there is a sequence in the fossil record or it's, yes. uh, as you know, Price advocated there wasn't and he gave good examples, uh, yes. he thought, and then we fought back and forth and uh, we are, uh, and we've had battles back and forth and the, the, the issue persists to this day. It does. In the, in the uh, creation literature. Uh, and I, I think you know, somebody could make just as good a story out of that about how uh, we persist with wrong information because it depends which side you want to be on uh, and so on. So uh, let's be understanding to a certain extent of, of uh, what goes on there. Well, I must say, uh, you can't be all that understanding all this data that Wells presented. There is a problem there. No question there's a problem there. But uh, they do it, I think, to a certain extent yeah. uh, uh, because they're sure they're right. Yeah. And they don't feel they're dishonest or that they're, they know the answer is correct. We've got to explain it, and they're just trying to explain one thing. If only one explanation doesn't work, then they try another. Uh, this is what the problem of self-deception, which is uh, prevalent in all of humanity, but we need to watch carefully against. That's true. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I think whenever we see this kind of thing going on, we need to stop and ask ourselves, are we doing some of this and should we uh, change our own uh, attitudes and behavior? Because if that's, you know, if we don't do that, then we doom ourselves to uh, basically intertribal warfare. And if that's all there is to it, then their tribe is bigger than ours. Well, we, we should uh, desperately try to despise all that, uh, but be understanding uh, that this is a, uh, a more difficult problem than just uh, the uh, superficial uh, deception that seems to appear. Well, um, if we're done with the discussion, uh, come back next week and we'll finish that chapter and we'll move on to uh, chapter four. Um, as you can see, Wells has done a lot of work and it's worth looking at what he has to say.